program is brought to you by NewsWorks in cooperation with the City of Eau Claire. This program is simulcast on WRFBLP 101.9 FM. We'll call this meeting to order. Looks like we have a good turnout tonight, which is good. Thank you for coming and welcome to the November 18th, 2019 meeting of the Eau Claire Plan Commission. This meeting is being broadcast live by Valley Media Works on Charter Channel 994, WRFPLP 101.9 FM, and online at valleymediaworks.org. The Planning Commission attempts to conduct its public meetings in a relatively informal manner within the constraint that we must deal with the issues before us in an orderly and businesslike fashion. We give the applicant an opportunity to speak first and then others, either for or against a, a proposal, are each permitted to speak once. We do request that everyone restrict their comments to the issues before us, avoid unnecessary repetition, and be prudent in the use of time. We want to be sure that we have adequate time to review and discuss all items with equal diligence. Please make sure that your cell phones are off or silent. If you plan to speak tonight, there are yellow slips of paper on the back counter. Please fill those out with your name and so on. Hand them to Mr. Petrie, who's up in front here. And then uh, when you come up to speak, please introduce yourself with your name and, and address. Um, we have, I just looked at this too. We have three items for a public hearing, which calls for, uh, an opportunity for the public to come up and speak. And then uh, the rest are public discussion, which is a discussion among the, the commissioners here and a uh, decision at the end. So with that, we'll begin with item number one, which is uh, was postponed from November 4th plan commission meeting. It's a public hearing for recommendation to the city council regarding a conditional use permit uh, at 328 Water Street and 325 Chippewa Street for a two-story mixed-use building with a drive-through. Mr. Petrie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members of the Commission and members of the public tonight, before you is a conditional use permit, as you mentioned, and a final site plan. This was a rehearing from your last meeting. The applicant is Investment Realty and along with the property owner, and the architect is Bob Johnson. It's number one on the map shown on the aerial. Here's a notification of 300 feet of the conditional use permit. We also put a sign out there that uh, the college students got a hold of and it was destroyed. Here is the zoning of the parcels. Along Water Street is zoned CBDP. That P is for the plan development. Uh, it is within the Water Street Commercial District Plan that was updated in 2009. The Conditional use also includes the RM par parcel on Chippewa Street, located at 320, uh, pardon me, 325 Chippewa Street. Here's an aerial photograph showing the existing building and the existing single family home on Chippewa Street. And we'll get into the site plan here shortly. Uh, the applicant is requesting a conditional use permit and final site plan tonight. This is the, the public hearing portion. The re proposed redevelopment is into two, um, two ground floor dwelling units and f uh, second floor apartments for four units. The parcel along Water Street is 11,000 square feet. The parcel along Chippewa Street is 8,316 square feet. This is the former BMO Harris drive up bank that has been relocated uh, to the 200 block of Water Street in 2017. The building has been for lease since that time. The conditional use you're reviewing tonight is three parts. The ground floor uh, dwelling units, the drive through, and the off street parking within the RM zoning uh, on Chippewa Street. Uh, the review criteria are in your packet as noted. Um, the dwelling units shall be uh, within the commercial uh, reviewed with the Water Street uh, commercial district plan as noted. The plan commission will need to determine that that is com uh, in compliance and appropriate within that. They should meet all our four standards and this proposal does meet those standards. The front half of the building is uh, two tenants, up to two tenants for commercial. 
the back half would be two tenants or two units for residential, four bedrooms each. Here's a zoomed in site plan showing the proposal. There's parking off the alley and then there's parking across the alley um, facing Chippewa Street with access to Chippewa Street. I would note the existing parcel does have two curb cuts existing. Uh, one is between the brother's property to the east that goes uh, shared access to their back of their property and then one for the existing drive through on the west side next to the goat house. Um, within the Water Street District Plan 2, it talks about um, parking off street within the two to 500 blocks. Uh, the applicant decided that instead of uh, asking for a waiver, he's removing the home at Chippewa Street to allow for 25 stalls of parking. The staff report does note that there's 29 stalls required. Um, there's actually 31 stalls proposed, I believe, um, unless my math is incorrect. He is relocating the parking um, for the bicycle racks in front of the building to be used for the residents and the commercial space. The drive through um, shall be reviewed as a conditional use of, as, as well. Um, in the Water Street com commercial plan, it does note no new curb cuts would be allowed. Um, there is currently an existing curb cut. The applicant is proposing to reduce that size down on the west end. The east end of the part, uh, curb cut would remain the same. The drive through must be relocated on the side or rear of the building. And then the proposal in front of you is on the side of the building. Uh, also, the design and location of the drive up uh, will not potentially uh, stack vehicles onto Water Street. And his proposal, there'll be stacking towards the alley uh, and uh, along the side of the building. And then also, the drive up design and location shall not affect pedestrian environment within the corridor. Um, the city uh, reviewed this and we recommend that he does a curb cut bump out like he did on the 200 block of, of Water Street for the BMO Harris ATM bank. Also adding a mirror and any kind of signage. And the plan commission can add any conditions to that uh, as a conditional use. Um, with the site plan part, it is a two story building, approximately 6,700 square feet. The site plan shows the layout of the commercial and residential areas. It also shows the existing easement on the east side, as I mentioned, and the proposed drive-through on the west side. The elevations of the proposed building is shown. He did, uh, the applicant did revise them. Unfortunately, it didn't meet the packet, but he did add, uh, it's fully brick on all four sides uh, with numerous windows and doors as you enter the property. The, Staff would recommend the bicycle racks not be located on the rear of the building, but rather along the Water Street side, uh, be used for the commercial and residential. There is a lack of bicycle parking in the Water Street corridor, especially in the 300 and 400 blocks. Extra lighting shall meet the city standards. I would note that they need to add a fence and screening along the west and east side of the existing or the proposed parking lot on Chippewa Street. Um, this has been reviewed by the Randall Park neighborhood and they provided a letter. It's also been reviewed by the Water Street bid and they provided a letter. We also provided an email um, this afternoon. We also provided to the commission tonight uh, another letter um, from the H Eau Claire Historic Preservation Foundation. And then also, I believe you have a letter from the Water Street bid. Grading and drainage is noted in the report along with public utilities, traffic, and transit. There is some few conditions that need to be met before uh, the site plan is approved tonight. And the, uh, this commission does have the authority to add any conditions or remove any of the conditions. Um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from the commission? Uh, Commissioner Brenholt. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Petrie, did the applicant indicate the type of business that's going to require the drive through Excellent question for the applicant. He is present here tonight. I would definitely ask him that question. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Any other questions? Uh, Commissioner Seymour. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Petrie, um, one of the letters that we received uh, has concerns about the approach on Chippewa Street. Um, from the standpoint of the city, 
could that parking lot be in that location without an approach to Chippewa Street? Um, or is, is, a, is the alley sufficient access for that parking lot? Excellent question. I would defer that to our city engineer, Leoness. We can look at the site distances available on Chippewa Street. I believe that we would end up removing a, a number of parking stalls along Chippewa if that's the concern related to the um, curb cut on Chippewa Street. Uh, adding access to 25 parking stalls through the alleyway, um, I'd say on average 50% would use the alley versus Chippewa Street. So I don't know that you're going to have a, a large reduction or increase of traffic over a day's time. Any other questions from the commission? Thank you, I see none. Is the uh, applicant here? Welcome. Good evening, uh, Joe Miller with Investment Realty, owner and developer of the property. Um, I'd be happy to answer any types of questions you may have. Okay, any questions for the uh, Commissioner Brentholm? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Miller, can you indicate the type of business that's going to require the drive-through? Yeah, so we are in negotiations with a company for the space. At this time, they've asked um, us not to mention their name with the series of negotiations we're in with them. Okay. You'd understand where it becomes difficult to understand how bad the congestion is going to be without knowing what type of business it is. Sure. Yep, okay, I thank understand. You. Thank you. Mr. Christofferson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Miller, I'm wondering, one of the um, letters from the uh, Randall Park Historic Neighborhood talked about, again, the stacking uh, on the drive through mm -hmm. And one piece of information that I thought was very interesting and would not have otherwise occurred to me is, what is the distance that you're planning between the order and the window? the the place where they place the order how many cars would be in that queue just from the order to the window um i believe it'd be in between four and five five okay. at max thank you commissioner wolf graham i'm sorry can you turn your microphone on oh, sorry thank you Mr. Miller, I'm interested in hearing your responses to Mr. Kosicki's letter. Okay. Um, which part specifically? The entire letter. Do you, do you have the letter? Um, not in front of me. Um, it was quite a lengthy letter that he wrote. About a page and a half, I think. Are we able to get it up on the screen at all? Or? I think it's page 15 of the page. Thank you. Would you like me to kind of go through the whole thing, or is there I something just, specific? Just to summarize okay. um, each, each one of his points, to address each one of his points. Sure. Um, I guess the first item is in regards to the drive out feature. It's not in accordance with the Water Street plan. Um, I actually did meet with the Water Street Business Improvement mm -hmm. District Board um, last week, and we discussed this, and they were actually they talked about how this is in line with their plan. Um, when they worked with the city a number of years ago and kind of put their plan in place, they actually, in that plan, it talks about drive-throughs being allowed with conditional use permit in the two, three, and 500 blocks of Water Street for that one. Um, <clears throat> the second item is in regards to higher density along Water Street. Um, again, in the Water Street business plan, it does talk about increasing the density along Water Street. 
um, which is exactly what we're trying to do is have additional density along Water Street and then in, in the attempt to pull higher density out of the Randall Park neighborhood. Um, let's see here, parking's insufficient. We are accommodated all parking. We have uh, what Ryan talked about. We have one for one parking uh, with the lot that we're going to have behind the, the building. So there'll be enough parking for the residential tenants and for commercial tenants when they're, when they're, when they're there. Um, In regards to item number four on here, it talks about lighting reflecting into bedroom windows um, and snow gets deposited on the property. Um, as far as lighting, the, the parking lot lights that we do use, they're about 18 to 20 foot tall and the lights can be adjusted. So if there are issues with it in the bedroom lights, the lights can be adjusted so it they shine more towards the parking lot. So that's something that we could fix. In regards to the snow getting deposited, I, I think I know what this is from. Last year when we essentially got snow every day for a month and we had a record break in snow, there was snow that got built up along the parking lot and a little onto his property. He did bring that to our attention in the form of a letter. At that time, we, we did subcontract with Haas to come in with end loaders and truck the snow out of the parking lot. And that's, that's pretty normal to what we would do. It all depends on the amount of snow that we get, but. If we do get quite a bit of snow, we do have some contractors come in and haul the snow out. Um, <clears throat> rent signs in every block. Um, we, we do have one other property on the 400 block of Water Street besides this property that does have a for rent sign in it. Um, we also have on our, our new building on the 200 block, we are in negotiations with a commercial tenant to take that entire space on the east side of the building. So I wouldn't really consider that as being for rent. Um, but there is one other space on Water Street that we have for rent. I, don't, I can't speak for my competition. Uh, number six talks about lots on Chippewa Street and displacing housing. Uh, it actually does talk about, again, in the Water Street business plan, about additional surface lots um, to support higher density along Water Street, and that's exactly what we're doing. There is a lot in the 200 block, two lots on the 400 block, one is a city lot, and then there's two lots on the 500 block existing already um, that supports the higher density commercial along Water Street. Was there anything else that you were kind of wondering about? or Can I do a quick follow-up? Yes. Uh, I would just like to support what Commissioner Bren Holt stated is that it's very it's very uh, difficult to assess this without knowing the at least the type of commercial business that's planned to go in there. So I just wanted to also support that frustration. Thank you. Sure, I can speak to that too. Um, yeah, it's the tenant that we're talking with. They asked us not to disclose any information because we're still working through the details of the lease. There's a chance that tenant may not even go in the space. Um, there's a chance that they would, and they would not take the space without a drive-through. I can tell you it would not be a Starbucks, it would not be a McDonald's, it would not be a Burger King, it would not be a fast food chain. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission? Commissioner uh, Gregor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Miller. Yeah. The, uh, I guess I'm thinking of some hypotheticals out there. At, um, if there's a, if the commission were to not grant um, a conditional use for a drive through for example, how would you see the project changing or how would you design the building differently? And I guess that to the same point, if you were not planning for a tenant that had a, a drive through need, how would you design the building differently? Well, the general design or floor plan of the building would remain the same um, with the limitations that we have on the lot and the square footage and footprint that we have would remain the same no matter what. Um, as far as you're asking if you did not approve the drive-through portion of it, okay. We would still need access to the side of the building um, for commercial tenants if they're having deliveries to come in and pull off a water street to load and unload. And if you know it on the elevations, we do have side access on each side of the building. Um, and that is, so as deliveries come, they're not stopping on Water Street and blocking up Water Street as they're throwing down their tailgates and coming out with deliveries, which does happen quite a bit with other commercial 
buildings along Water Street and on the side streets. So the design is so that they can pull in and offload load and go on the side. Mr. Chair, another question? Yeah. Go Thank ahead. you. Yes, go ahead. Um, I guess uh, this is kind of along the same lines. If, if there was not a, if the commission were to, to not approve a, uh, a, a conditional use for uh, ground floor residential, how would you see the building designed differently? Um, we would not be able to build the building. With the square footage of the building um, and, and the size of it, if we did not have the ground floor, we would need an elevator for the building. With the, can I just follow up on that? Yes. Sure. With, because this building is located on a 300 block, we have some limitations with construction. So as you can see up in here, it's a complete construction block, um, perimeter walls. And then you know, we do the brick facade on the front and back, which adds a significant amount to the construction cost to build the building versus just doing wood framed of the building. So where we're at right now with what we project the cost of the building being to make this project feasible, we need the ground floor. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission? Commissioner Christofferson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if I'm going to follow up on Commissioner Wolfgram's uh, question about um, that letter. And when I read through that concern from one of the businesses on Water Street, they were uh, speaking of the uh, automobile lights reflected into the residential windows. Do you see anything that you would be able to do to prevent that kind of um, disruption for the residents? Sure, absolutely. You, so um, currently, 325 Chippo, which is where the proposed surface lot would be, does have a higher elevation. However, we're lowering the elevation of that parcel, so it is going to come down. We have talked with the adjacent property owners, and they have um, have requested us to put up a fence um, along to the west side of the parking lot. And we said that is fine. We can do a fence along there to kind of help him as cars are pulling in, so they're not shining on his his property. Yes. Then I that was uh, another question that that as you were going through your responses, I was wondering um, because about the fence along the parking lot. That would, had been required at an, another space, but didn't appear. But you, you have no difficulty in, in the screening and fence being installed on the Chippewa Street lot? Uh, no, I do not. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Brenholz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Miller, as a follow-up to a question that Commissioner Seymour had, um, it's been suggested that, that the curb cut into Chippewa Street not be made for the parking lot and that all entrances to that parking lot come off the alley? Is that doable? And I'm probably asking you that question as well as Ms. Ness. And would that, would that be acceptable to you? I guess we have not considered that. I would say that that would not be the norm with the existing surface parking lots on Chippewa Street now. They all have curb cuts coming out on the Chippewa Street. Okay, but there's not a curb cut in front of 325. Yeah, right. We could certainly look at that, and if the city would allow that, we could look at at, at that. Um, we have not considered that up until okay. this point. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Any, uh, Commissioner Gregor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Miller, the, um, there was a, it seemed to be that our staff was unsure as to how many parking spaces are being uh, provided for off street with this project do you think you could fill us in on on that as far as the rear surface parking lot or just in general or I guess the I, I see that there are some right behind the building mm -hmm. um, and then there are also some in the the service lot proposed behind the building so if maybe you could is it is it 31 or is it some other number <laughs> Um, I don't have my site plan in front of you. I thought it was 31 to 32 spots. Um, let's see if I got it here. <clears throat> I 
30 spots according to the site plan. Yep. Commissioner Wolfgram. Mr. Miller, uh, do you, are you aware if the Water Street Business District folks talk to the historic Randall Park Neighborhood Association folks? Um, I am not aware if members of the bid did talk with the Neighborhood Association. I will tell you when I presented the proposal to them, I did discuss that the neighborhood had supported the proposal minus the drive through and I listed their concerns that they um, had in their letter and both when I was at the meeting when I presented to them. So um, I tried to make a point to kind of let them know exactly what the neighborhood's concerns were. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any more? Commissioner Gregor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Miller, the, the drive through I had a question about that in the, in the queuing. I know we had a question earlier. Uh, my understanding is that the cars would be right next to windows of bedrooms on one of the six units. Mm -hmm. um, how far away from those from those bedroom windows is is the drive through proposed? And um, I guess do you have any? How did you decide to design the building with that feature? I guess you could say. Well, the the cars will come around. There will be a slight curb um, in between the cars and the building to kind of bump them out a little bit from that. Um, but the cars would come around, they'd be in the drive through The drive through right now, I believe, is proposed at 16 feet wide on the plan, so. I guess a follow-up question would be, is, if there's, is there some sort of curb that's keeping those cars away from the, from the windows, or? Yes, that's correct. It, it would be very similar to what we have at 222 Water Street. We put a curb to keep cars away from the building. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Christofferson. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Miller. Um, I, I'm going to read Mr. Gregert's um, mind by saying, is there a possibility that you would enjoy putting bike racks both at the back and at the front of the building since there is a shortage of uh, bike racks in this, this part of the quarter? Yeah, absolutely. We have no problem with that additional bike racks. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission? I have a couple. So uh, the way I'm looking at this, uh, looks like there's about 50, maybe 56 feet from the drive up window to the back corner and then there's space before the alley that is as uh, long as the parking stall. So let's say 70 feet. Um, that's enough to get a stack of five cars off of the before it reaches the alleyway, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Can you tell me how many uh, cars are able to stack? Now, I know at the uh, Aspenson Mogensen building, it's just an ATM there, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. How many cars can stack there off of the alleyway, do you know? Well, the, the building itself is 100 foot deep, Aspenson Mogensen Hall. Um, uh, and then there is, there is a kind of a curb bump out. So I would say there is probably about 75 to 80 feet to the back of the alleyway at Aspenson Mogensen Hall. Okay. So it would be, it would be similar to here. Similar to mm -hmm. here, okay. Um, and then a couple other questions, if I may. Yeah. So uh, this curb space between the bedroom and where the, the, uh, the cars queue up, is there wide enough space there to put some kind of greenery or? Um, no, there would not be enough space to, uh, to put some sort of greenery along okay. there. And then finally, uh, one of the letters that we received from uh, Historic Randall Park talked about enhanced, uh, oh, I'm sorry. An enhanced green space area. Did you see that letter? I did see that, yes. Um, is there anywhere with, you know, I'd like your feedback on that. Yeah, sure. Um, there would be, with the design of the building, what we have to work with for the lot size, there may be some some room in the in the front, kind of in the boulevard, they, you know, there's some, where there's some trees could go there, but 
the majority of it would be along the parking lot and back, and where the curb cut is going out to Chippewa Street, there could be shrubs and greenery there. Okay. So to get to your point, on both the west and east side, um, there would not be room for that. Okay. But there would be fence there, right? Are we talking along the... The West parking and lot. East side, yeah, along the parking yes, lot. yes, there would be fencing. Sorry, there would be fencing, but there's also on the east side of it. There's like a bioretention area that goes along okay. the east side of the parking lot, and then on the north side where it goes out to Chippewa Street, you can see on the site plan we have it noted for additional shrubbery greenery okay. on the site plan. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission? I see none. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone from the public who came to speak on this topic tonight? I suspect there is, or there are. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me the time to speak as well. Um, my name is Karin Zielinski. I'm a resident at 307 Chippewa Street, so I actually utilize that alley, which is being talked about, and I'm also an employee at the Goat Coffee House. So coming for both of those reasons today. Um, I first wanted to address our concerns um, from our business about the potential for this drive-through to cause issues over safety. Um, obviously, there's a lot of pedestrian traffic that goes through the area. Um, as well as that back alley. Many of those pedestrians are also our customers, and we worry about the potential for a collision um, with the people walking, and obviously people aren't supposed to bike on the sidewalk there, but people do bike, and we're worried about the potential for a collision. Um, another worry that we have is that there is only space for uh, five cars to be in that drive through and we've seen other drive throughs in the city where there are eight, nine, 10 cars on a Friday or Saturday night, and so we're wondering where exactly are all these cars supposed to go. Uh, right now, we're assuming the alley, which becomes a huge issue, um, blocking up the right of way of that alley, which is actually against a specific city, uh, city ordinance um, for alley use regulations. Um, I also wanted to come up here today to present a petition that we started at the Goat Coffee House and that we also had at Staven Hoop next door. Um, after about four days, we have 208 signatures saying that they oppose this project, especially for the reason of having a drive through there. Um, so it is not just our coffee house or just Staven Hoop um, that sees this as a potential problem, but also 208 other people that live here. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the commission? Commissioner Gregor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Zielinski. The um, could you speak to a bit more of the use of the of the Goat Coffee House by customers entering and exiting from the back? And I understand there's also a patio. There's mm -hmm. different reasons to use that space by customers as well as by employees. Do you think you could describe that a little bit more? And and uh, my understanding as well is that this the patio is like right next to where the the cars would be queuing up mm -hmm. in this proposed drive-through. Yeah, so we do have a patio in the back that is widely used when it's nicer out, obviously, so more during the summer months. Um, that would be right next to the drive-through. Um, so while there's also people that would be living in residence in this project that are going to have cars right next to them, we're also going to have our patio space um, where people are going to be right next to cars. We also have two tables out front, one of which um, is on the side of the building where the cars would be exiting and they would be extremely close to the cars that are exiting. Um, so there's also potential there for some collisions if people aren't looking out for where they're going. Um, a lot of our customers, I mean, they enter in through both ways, the back and the front, but a lot of them come through the front. Um, and we're concerned about especially people exiting the building um, and not realizing that a car is coming out of the drive through and the potential for collision there. Great. Any other questions from the commission? I see none. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the members of the public here to speak on this topic tonight? Welcome. Hello, my name is Lauren Learman. I live at 719 Fourth Avenue and I'm the president of the Historic Randall Park Neighborhood Association. I'll make things brief because I left you a letter. Um, I just feel 
personally and with a lot of neighbors that we were listened to but not necessarily heard in our concerns of this project. And looking at someone who is part of the community of people with disabilities, seeing apartments for people with disabilities put next to a drive-through with that potential when there's so few options available is kind of insulting to me. And I just feel very strongly that this does not fit in our neighborhood. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Brenhall. Yes, um, would you be supportive without the drive-through? We did vote initially to support this project without the drive-through, and they did come back after this was postponed on plan commission to present this to us, and we presented our concerns at that point. Okay, thank you. Thank you, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the public? Ms. Meyer. I'm always happy. <laughs> Good evening. Um, <laughs> um, my name is Helene Smyer. I live at 320 Broadway Street in historic Randall Park neighborhood. And I did send a letter on behalf of our Neighborhood Revitalization Corporation. And not to confuse the two, we are a not-for-profit arm of the association and so we are in agreement with the association that this is not um, proper use, land use. I would add to something I didn't think of when I wrote the letter that I don't think this proposal meets your city comprehensive plan um, objectives and I refer to the transportation system plan section three page two big fat document. I know you're familiar with it, but there may not be people in the audience. So just one, a few statements that when you talk about your goals and objectives for thoroughfare systems, you one of your goals is to minimize negative impacts to adjacent land uses and the community. It seems to be that you've been given plenty of reasons to see that it will have a negative impact for safety reasons and you would like consistent, predictable driving environments. And I don't think a drive-through is predictable. And they can't even predict who might be there and how many people you've asked that question yourself. How do you make a decision when you don't even know um, what's going to be there? And then in another section, when you talk about a balanced system, you, there really is, your objective is to increase and accommodate walking bicycling, bus riding, and to support a system that finds alternatives to the drive-alone automobile trip. Drive-through is a drive-alone automobile trip. So I don't think it meets with your city comprehensive plans. And I didn't put that in my letter. But in my letter, our main issue with the not, this is just an idea, just a proposal, not to have the cut on the Chippewa Street side is more for aesthetics and more for um, keeping a co cohesiveness in that residential area because the 300 block is raised. So you have um, steps that go up to the um, sidewalks that go to the door. So it's a little different than the 200 block, which is flat, and the 400 and 500, they're flat. This is raised. We think that it's sort, it would be dangerous coming down that slope with a cut in winter especially. Um, we think also for the aesthetics and the cohesiveness, if it's possible from a city standpoint to just use the alley, it's, it's something to think about. It's a thought. And we absolutely agree with the association on Take, removing the curb cut in front of the building, the building will be an addition. We are not opposed to the development. It will be better looking than what's there now, more useful. But if you also at the same time consider putting the curb back and the sidewalk, you'll, you'll, which has those bricks and it has a more historic character to it, it would improve the whole cityscape on the Water Street side. So our thought is that the least amount of disruption to the residents 
and the more cohesive historic character we can keep on Water Street are both of our points from our revitalization point of view because that's what we're about. That's what we're concerned about is when development comes in, how do we least impact what we already have that um, is the character of the neighborhood. And I would add that sort of in that 200 block where that parking lot is, <clears throat> I, I personally got these ideas because I think we did, we did not pay attention to these details. If you look at that parking lot, there's maybe a foot and a half space between the sidewalk and the parking. So as you're walking down the residential area, you're just confronted with these cars. There are no barriers, which is why the, the neighbor, I don't know which side that neighborhood, Dave, I know his name is Dave, the snow is pushed into his residence. I'm almost sure that when we, you approved the 200 block, there were supposed to be barriers there, but they aren't. But our thought is that we would prefer in the 300 block that you put enhanced landscaping because it's, it's green and it's prettier than just fences. And if you restore the curbs, if you choose to do that, you have two more parking spots on Water Street. And so you could really come back to that parking pad on Chippewa's side and take away two spots and add more greenery to the, to the streetscape there if that makes sense. These are all just ideas. They seem aesthetically pleasing. So I thank you for listening. Um, and I, if you have any questions about our letters, I didn't go through the letters. I merely put the point about we are doing a beautification project on First Avenue. And I happen to be the um, project coordinator. I simply pointed that out because in doing that, we had the cooperation of the city staff, of master gardeners. Uh, I mean, we had to get approval from you and from the um, Waterways Commission. It was a very collaborative project. And if we're, as volunteers, taking such concern for the aesthetics of the neighborhood, maybe we should carry that theme through to, for development. If they're asking for conditional use, I propose that we could ask for some enhancement, some beautification. I think that's all. If you have any questions, I'm, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions from the commission? All right, thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Good evening. I'm Judy Mosley. I'm the co-chair of the Jonah Affordable Housing Task Force, and I live at 2230 Trimble Street here in Eau Claire, which makes me not a member of the Randall Park neighborhood, but I did want to speak in support of their concerns. Um, I think that any time the neighbors are concerned about something, we should take that seriously because they're the ones that have to live with the results. And so, you know, their concerns are important. But I also wanted to mention that I was a little bit disappointed in this plan from the housing standpoint because there was no mention of affordability. And yet when you look at the plans for these apartments, they are obviously very, very small apartments. Um, you know, you've got 100 square feet of a private bedroom space and you've got 500 square feet of shared space for four adults. And that makes it a tiny apartment. Um, shouldn't it also, as the trade-off for being so small, shouldn't it also be affordable? Um, and I'm presuming that it is not because that was not mentioned anywhere in the plans. Thank you. Any questions? All right, thank you. Any other members of the public here to speak on this topic tonight? Yes, sir. Good evening. Dave Kasitsky. I own the Stephen Hoop Liquor Store at 342 Water Street. I've been a member of the bid board back before when we had a varied group of representative business people on the Water Street, and it wasn't just solely John's various businesses. We always fought to keep the character of the neighborhood a certain way. 
we didn't want large national chains coming in, and in fact, McDonald's left because of that. We wanted to have small people that could have some character to the neighborhood, and boy, do we have character on Water Street. I've already sent you a letter with some of the problems that we had with the parking lot on the 200 block of Chippewa Street. The plan commission specified that there had to be concrete barriers, which would have helped prevent snow from being deposited onto our property. I did call the fact that there was supposed to be screening to John's attention earlier. That has not yet happened. The thing that people aren't looking at is we're looking at bedrooms with cars right outside of them. So that's not, you know, a really ideal situation. You're looking at 16 foot alleyways against that, so you're not gonna have any big curbs or anything like that. That car is gonna be sitting outside that bedroom idling. The, um, can you bring up the site plan? The site plan shows two parking spots on the corners, and if you're the average um, car going around that corner, you're gonna be infringing on both of those two corner parking spots. Um, as far as I can see, I'm not seeing where the dumpster's located, but I'm guessing that if there's a commercial business big enough to have a drive-through, it's gonna have to have a substantial dumpster. You're gonna end up with far less than 30 spots on that back lot because you're gonna have some place to park snow. You're probably gonna have some place to have a bike rack, and you're gonna have a dumpster. So the reality is you're losing a couple spots on the curb cut onto Chippewa. You're also losing a couple more spots. And if you have uh, 24 bedrooms, you can assume you're gonna have 24 cars. If you have that kind of square footage for commercial, you're gonna assume you're gonna have a few employees and a parking pretty tight down there already. Finally, if you try to pull out from 4th Avenue onto Water Street today at five o'clock, you waited for 10 minutes and you were still running, running over pedestrians. If you start pulling out mid-block at those hours, it's gonna be really a nightmare and you're gonna have people stopping trying to get into the property, and that's gonna make it even more so challenging. I've addressed most of these in my letter, but I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, any questions? Commissioner Seymour. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify, there is a dumpster uh, in the parking lot on Chippewa. Um, it's that box, if you, if you go straight north from those uh, handicap spots, that's the dumpster location. Just to clarify. Thank you, any other questions? All right, thank, thank you. you. Any other members of the public here to speak on this topic? Mr. Mogensen. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Um, I guess I just wanted to bring a couple things up. In or 2009, uh, I was on the Water Street Business District. I've been on there. I was one that started it, so I've been the chairman ever since. And we had um, the business owners from Water Street, the Randall Park neighborhood, the City of Eau Claire staff, UW Eau Claire, Police Department, everybody involved with writing the Water Street Business District Plan. And everything that we've um, proposed today is allowed in the Water Street Plan. Um, our plan, the Water Street Business District, is not the Randall Park Neighborhood District. They're the neighbors, we're the business district. It's two different things. Um, I know that they don't agree with what we're doing sometimes, um, and sometimes we don't agree with them, but um, it, this is part of the Water Street Business District. We did have a meeting and we told the members, a lot of them were on um, the bid district when we wrote, rewrote the plan in 2009. But I just wanted to let you know that what we're proposing is not anything different from what the Water Street merchants are trying to create a high density business district. We're not trying to create um, a Randall Park neighborhood. Um, one of the, I don't know where you put this up here. Let's see here. This is down on, for an example, 
this is down on North Barstow. Um, it's where the Mayo Clinic used to have a drive through and now it's the uh, Slushy Bar Espresso drive through um, That's been there for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. They've never had a problem with it. Um, and if you think about it, we have um, outdoor seating areas like on Water Street, behind Mona Lisa's, Mogi's, in the livery, and all these areas have cars continually going through the alley, continually going um, behind the livery and stuff like that. I mean, it's, um, we've never had a problem, so I don't know where the, the, it's a safety issue because there's, as far as I know, nobody's been hurt or run over leaving a, um, outdoor seating area. But I just wanted to let you know that the Water Street merchants are voted, you know, to approve this plan, even though they knew that the Randall Park neighborhood was opposed to it. We're trying to create a business district, not a neighborhood on Water Street. So uh, we feel that, or they felt that this is, and it, this drive-through has been there forever, and, um, if the bank would have continued, it would have been a drive-through for the GOAT. So, you know, it's not any different than it was for the last 20 years or so. And I guess if there's any other questions, um, I'd be happy to answer. Okay. Um, any questions from the commission? No. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any other members of the public? Right. Uh, there's no sheets left, though. Okay. So. <clears throat> Can you give us your name yeah. and address? Brian Benister. I own the Goat Coffee House on Water Street at 336. So uh, just to answer some of that stuff there, uh, in 2009, I was never invited to any meeting of any sort, and I was a business owner down there then, to be clear. I've been down there for 15 years. Also, the Goat has never, ever had any intentions of doing any drive through whatsoever. We are happy with our building. We're happy with having people come into our building. Uh, that's the main focus of us, is having pedestrians walk to our building from the university. Uh, the drive through that they're talking about on downtown doesn't have the, the traffic that it does at down on Water Street because of the university that's right there with the 11,000 students. All of the housing that's down there, um, I, I'm just, I have a variety of customers that come to my store, whether they're students or they're older people, Handicapped, not handicapped, we're concerned with the issue of the safety of the drive through It's just too dangerous. There's no sight line. I would never agree to it. I would never do it in my shop. I'm very animate when I get called out. So I apologize for my anger, but um, I wasn't a part of any meeting. I never want to do a drive through I'm happy with my location. I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Seymour. Thank you. If if it weren't for the drive-through, would you be in favor of this project? Um, I'd be more in favor of it than I am right now. Um, I'd have to see what they're going to do with it. I, uh, I don't like packing that many people into a small building. Um, that's a concern for me there. Uh, the lack of green space is a big concern for me also. So uh, the drive-through is a main concern of mine, but I could, I could come across if there wasn't one there. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission? All right. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Appreciate it. Any other members of the public here to speak on this tonight? I see none. Is there a motion from the commission to uh, get this item before us? I move approval of the uh, site plan. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Commissioner Seymour. <laughs> Any discussion? Pardon me. I'll start right away. <laughs> Commissioner Granholt. Um, Granholt. I, I have real trouble with plans that come through that 
are a little bit sketchy as far as the location of things like curb cuts. Uh, the plan we've seen so far, although it shows the alley location, doesn't show the adjustments on the existing curbs and where that curb cut is with respect to the parcel boundary. It, uh, looking at the photographs, I think you can typically see that the, the exit drive through from the bank is not actually all the way in line with the rest of the drive along that parcel boundary. It, it swerves away from the goat at the end. Um, and the current plan just doesn't show that same relationship of where the curb cut exists compared to the street and it, uh, compared to the site boundary. There's some things about uh, the site plan I think is a little bit sketchy even though it's pretty detailed as part where the rooms are. Um, I have trouble with uh, plans that require a, a whole list of exemptions or a, a whole list of other um, conditions. And um, I really, I have a hard time thinking that anyone wants a bedroom on a ground floor on a brand new alley in an area with bars around it. Thank you. Any other? Discussion, Commissioner Christofferson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this particular development, although it has its advantages in um, filling that space with commercial for Water Street and removing um, an unproductive area, the use of, of that residential also concerns me because that that entire area of Water Street is a very intense pedestrian uh, walkway. And when we use other drive-throughs on Barstow or, or the downtown, I don't, I don't think there's another environment that really mimics what happens on Water Street. And it's, it's pretty much 24 seven, well, except for during the summer. But there's, there's heavy pedestrian traffic all the time. And then you add bicycles, um, we would have uh, truck uh, deliveries to those commercial areas. It seems like it's a lot of intense traffic in an area that they're trying to make also intensely residential for students. Um, so that, that concerns me, but I would be able to only stand at that area of, I think that the drive-through is inappropriate that close to residential for students. Thank you. Any other discussion? Commissioner Krager. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I certainly share some of the concerns of my colleagues on the commission here. I, um, <clears throat> and certainly some folks in the, in the neighborhood and businesses, I, I think, you know, it is a, um, yeah, there are there are a lot of different uh, aspects of of this that are, you know, conditional uses. So that um, I know that a lot of that was negotiated for as part of that Water Street business district plan. That that some of these types of uses would be a possibility, like the drive-through. Um, that plan is now, I don't know, almost ten years old. Um, but I guess some of the one of the things that I found somewhat striking, I guess, from, from Mr. Mogensen was that he was thinking of it as a, as a business district, but in fact, I, it is, when, you're, when you're proposing housing of this density, and um, it's also a neighborhood, and I, I think we need to, to make sure that our uh, developments are recognizing that it is a, a great mix of, of people on Water Street and a lot of different uses, a lot of uh, great history, uh, traditions, <laughs> uh, some of them, um, you know, they're going, um, are probably not going to change regardless of what kind of development we build, but we need to, um, I think, restore some of the, of the historic character of Water Street, particularly on this block, because, um, like, I consider th this block to be, or this particular location to be one that we need to we do need to find an appropriate project to, to fill um, the old uh, 
BMO Harris Bank building, but this maybe isn't quite right uh, for this for this spot. Um, so I, I really can't see myself supporting it the way it's being proposed, even even if it weren't to have a drive-through. Um, I also want to point out that the the only entrance and exit, at least as, as I understand it, from the ground floor residential is from the alley, uh, which is a kind of a strange way to um, to enter one's home and en exit one's home as like really the only option. I guess I could be missing something with regard to this design, but um, that that makes me very concerned about the about having ground floor residential in addition to having the the drive through next to it. So just wanted to point that out as well. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Wolfgram. Thank you, Chairperson Larson. So I support what Commissioner Gregert um, just said as well. I understand that the Water Street Business District Association is different from the Neighborhood Association, but I see the business district being part of the neighborhood without distinct boundaries between them. I find it interesting that even though the plan in 2009 was a collaborative one, that when a development like this is proposed, that the business district people would not meet themselves with the Neighborhood Association. I also respect greatly um, the folks on the ground. Um, the young man, I'm sorry, I don't remember your last name. I don't want to get it in incorrect. Um, who spoke about really the, un, the, the unpredictable driving environment. And that makes sense to me. That makes sense to me that that is a safety concern. And the owner of the GOAT, his experience as well. So I really, I respect that feedback. Those are the, those are the people that are on the ground living with this situation, so I, I would like to support the development, but I could not support it with the drive-through included. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no other comments, I have a few to make. Um, <clears throat> there are th actually three parts of this conditional use permit. Uh, one is for ground, ground floor dwelling units. The second is for a drive-through. And the third is for off-street parking lot. And then there is uh, included in this same motion that we have before us is to approve the site plan. So the way I see it, if, if there's a part of this that we would, uh, that someone would consider removing then we should have a motion to remove one or more of the conditional use permits if that's what we so desire to discuss um, so that's just sort of a procedural thing that i think we need to and then if there are amendments to the site plan that we want to make i know we talked about curb cuts and uh, and so on so uh, that i think we would have to deal with in a separate motion if there are changes to the site plan that we want to make. But in terms of the, the project it, itself, um, I, I'm really not, uh, I know that we've had discussion in the past about, uh, let me back up again, because I want to uh, echo the fellow commissioners who here who have noted that Historic Randall Park is not the business uh, district, but I'm happy to hear their input because it affects their neighborhood. And when when we uh, we recently had uh, an issue with the third ward and and the university, and we asked that they work together a little more on the uh, third ward neighborhood plan because the, what happens in one they're so close together. It's just it's it's really inseparable. The interests are almost inseparable. And in that context, we've talked about for the historic Randall Na uh, Park neighborhood that we uh, one of their goals is to reduce or to get a higher percentage 
of owner-occupied homes. And one of the obstacles to that is the high value of houses that are being purchased as an investment rather than a living space. So I remember discussions where we said what we would prefer to see is higher density houses, housing on the south end, close to the business uh, district uh, to compete with the investment value of the houses in the, in the neighborhood, that that's an appropriate place for us to have high density housing along Water Street and even we've got some in, into Chippewa Street. Um, so that part of the project, the ground floor housing, um, the fact that we have high density housing in the project, I see as a positive. I think it's a positive that it's, um, it seems to be marketed towards student housing. We have a shortage of student housing and this seems to be appropriate for that, an appropriate location and appropriate development for that reason. I think the off street parking is an advantage to the neighborhood because we've talked about uh, the need to have more off street parking for uh, because of the, the high density parking that we have along Chippewa Street, for example. Um, <clears throat> I think that the, uh, when we talk about the historic nature of, of the business district down there, the existing building adds nothing to our historic uh, appearance of that neighborhood. And I think Mr. Mogensen uh, has a, a good track record of building quality buildings that fit in with the kind of neighborhood that we want. So I, I think that the project itself is a good project. I do also have some of the same concerns that the other commissioners have on the drive-through. I have a lot of experience down on Water Street. I was a, many of you know I was a police officer here. I spent uh, many months doing foot patrol down on Water Street. I patrolled it during the day and later as a district commander, um, I, I did foot patrol again on Water Street <clears throat> in the evenings. Uh, most of the time, I, I worked nights a lot. So the bank there was closed. But uh, to address the, the issue of whether or not there were, that we've had incidents there, I can't point to a specific one, but I believe we have had conflicts between vehicles and, and pedestrians or bicycles. And uh, it's not a surprising thing. I've always viewed that drive through as problematic for the 300 block of, of Water Street. In fact, one time we had a, uh, we brought together the neighborhood association and members of city council, and there might have been plan commission members maybe who sh shared both seats, and brought them down to Water Street um, on, a, on a Friday night to just kind of show them what the police were dealing with down there. And one of the issues that we discussed was the fact that we have this drive-through in the mid-block with poor visibility, and even at night it was used, it was crammed with cars when the bank was closed the cars pull in there and fill up that parking lot. And then they're leaving at bar time when there are hundreds of people on that street. I'm also recognized that um, the GOAT had a petition here with over 200 signatures. Those are people who frequent the Water Street Business District. They're patrons, not only of the GOAT, but other businesses in that area. And they're concerned enough to put their name to a piece of paper saying we're concerned about this traffic. I know also that the bicycles are not supposed to be on the sidewalk and neither are the skateboards, but they are. The mirrors help, but I just don't think that's an appropriate location for a drive through. So with that, if there are motions to be made, unless there's further discussion that somebody wants to have, I would be ready to entertain motions. Um, I'm assuming you want me to speak. Yes, I, okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I didn't want to speak out of turn. Mr. Chair, I, I, appreciate your, I appreciate your comments 
and I appreciate your suggestions or that there may be motions that we want to make. However, in my mind, there are so many variables in this site plan, and I'd have to ask my fellow commissioners whether or not it's our role to rewrite the site plan in various ways that the developer may not even be in favor of. So if it were, if it were my druthers, uh, my druthers would be to vote on the motion that Commissioner Granlin made. Thank you. Any other discussion? Commissioner Seymour. Thank you. And <clears throat> that motion includes all three of these conditional uses. So you're talking about not separating them. That's, that's correct. Okay. We just have a point. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Any other discussion? Commissioner Gregor. Yeah, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess to um, the point of, you know, whether to separate these out, um, the it seemed like you know if we if we didn't uh, vote to do a drive through it wouldn't necessarily change the building significantly they would still want to utilize the the two access points on either side of the building so at least that one doesn't seem like it would it would cause too many changes and uh, to the to the intent um, so. Just, just one point I wanted to make. Thank you. Any other discussion? Mr. Gregor. I, so thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess I would move to uh, amend the, the motion to uh, not um, approve the conditional use for the drive through Okay, is there a second? I'll second. Mr. Wolfgram, any discussion on that motion to amend? Commissioner Wolfgram. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Any discussion? Commissioner Gregor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel that, you know, the pedestrian, it is really one of the most pedestrian focused streets, and historically it's been that way. Um, and, I, and I've certainly, been on Water Street at, at, during the day as well as at night where I can see that being a problem. Um, obviously, it is something that is considered allowable under the Water Street Business District Plan, so I appreciate um, that fact, but I, I, given the, the particular circumstances of, of the way it's designed and where it's proposed to be located, I don't think it's appropriate, uh, particularly when it would be next to um, Res ground floor residential. Um, so, thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, we'll call the question on the motion to amend. And this, uh, an I vote would take the conditional use permit for a drive through out of the uh, general motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? One. So we're back to the original motion. Any further discussion? Commissioner Christofferson. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Um, I'm, I'm going back to our, our issue here of, um, I found it interesting to hear from Mr. Miller that certain things would make this um, a not profitable design, and I don't know exactly what those are, but um, I would like to hear more conversation from the commissioners about the um, off-street parking lot. There were several uh, points brought from the public about the uh, curb cut, the um, entrance from the alley versus through the alley to Chippewa. Um, I thought, I, I really felt that the residents, um, Randall, historic Randall Park residents, concern um, about that being upward into the park or the parking lot, but then the developer said that they're going to lower that grade 
Um, I, I would like to hear more conversation about that. Okay. Any other discussion about that or any other topics on this? Commissioner Gregor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I think it's it's part of a, a larger, um, just a whole collection of different issues, I guess, that I see, you know, with this proposed development. So I, at this time, I don't plan on supporting the motion to uh, to approve it, but um, partly because of concerns about, you know, taking down a house on, on Chippewa Street for parking at, as a, as a um, and obviously that is also something in the Water Street Business District plan that said was allowable and, you know, in, in fact, somewhat encouraged in that plan, which is a little um, strange, I think, in some ways, considering the, the neighborhood really is impacted negatively, in my opinion, by taking out housing for parking behind Water Street. So, um, yeah. Okay. Mr. Seymour. Thank you. <clears throat> as, as far as the curb cut on the Chippewa, well, I think it's, it's a good idea not to have it, and I think it would look better. <clears throat> I do worry about um, traffic coming in and out of these alleys at the ends of the block, and I think you know, if if we're not happy about a drive-through with cars shooting out onto Water Street, I think at least on the Fourth Avenue end of um, the block, I, I think you're pushing traffic to another spot that is really dangerous. If you've ever taken a look at that area, um, I th you have a couple of volleyball courts with high fences and. Um, vines growing on those fences. I think that's that's a dangerous spot too. Um, now maybe at the end of Third Avenue it's a little better, although it looks like there's a house kind of right on the corner. So I guess I, I think I think the curb cut on Chippewa, while it's it may not look the best, might be safer than the option of everybody coming and going through the alley. Um, and if I could, can I say one more yes. thing? Um, as long as we're talking about um, the, uh, the conditional use things, um, as far as um, dwelling units on the ground floor, uh, this commission has <clears throat> approved that. Um, before uh, for a another developer, although he never did the project, but there is the precedent that we have approved that in the past. Thank you. Any other discussion? I see none, so we will call the motion on the uh, on the item so we have before us uh, conditional use permits for ground floor dwelling off street parking and to approve the site plan all those in favor say aye aye all those opposed same sign aye, aye. okay we, we better show hands okay all those in favor raise your hand Opposed? Same sign. One, two, three, four, five. And that item fails. Thank you. We'll move on to item number two, which is a public hearing for recommendation to City Council. Uh, a request to recommend approval to rezone property from C1A to R2 at 21. 27 Necessity Street. Mr. Allen. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the commission. Again, before you this evening is a request uh, to rezone property. Shown here, number two on the overview map, which is uh, east of North Claremont uh, between Vine and Cameron. A little bit more uh, close-up view of that. Uh, again, Necessity Street is uh, where the uh, property is addressed off of. You can see uh, Warden there on the west, right north-south, connecting Cameron and Vine in this area. Uh, the current zoning is C1A. It is a vacant office building. I'm just showing the, uh, the properties that were directly noticed for tonight's public hearing. Here shows a little bit better uh, the area. Uh, it is currently a vacant office building. Uh, from what I understand, uh, it was previously uh, the office building for the Burger King restaurants. Uh, again, it's been uh, vacant here. I don't recall exactly how long, but the property and the structure itself uh, were built uh, in 1970. The surrounding area is zoned C3 to the west. I'll jump back here, you can see a little bit more clearly. C3 to the west and east, and R2 to the north and south. So kind of along a, a strip there of some R2 residential just south of the here and also to the north. Uh, the request from the applicant is to reuse the existing vacant building, uh, turn it into a duplex structure, again, in line with some of the other zoning area, uh, zoning pro zone properties in the area. Uh, the total proposed duplex would be approximately uh, 1,766 feet in size. Uh, the, a final site plan, uh, compliance with city codes, shall also be submitted in conjunction with building permit application uh, because of this uh, change of use here. Uh, application will likely be reviewed and administratively approved unless there's some reason that uh, the overall site would be modified greatly from what you see already in place. Uh, staff is requesting uh, what requires part of the site plan, uh, removing the large area asphalt you see there to the east side. Again, primarily that was previously used for parking for the commercial use. And with that, again, staff does find the request consistent with copies of plan and is noted uh, compatible with the surrounding area and uh, we recommend approval of the request. Stand for any questions. Thank you. Any questions from the commission? I see none. Thank you. Thank you. Is the applicant here? Uh, just reminded by Mr. Petrie, uh, we were notified by the applicant that they are out of town tonight, so they're unable to be here today. Okay. Are there any members of the public who came to? Sp Ooh, excuse me. Are there any men members of the public who came to speak on this topic tonight? I see none. Is there a motion from the commission? I move that it be approved as presented. Commissioner Christofferson. Mr. Granlund. I'll second. Thank you. Any discussion? I see none. All those in favor, well, so I will call the question. All those in favor of this item, signify, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Thank you. Item number three is a public hearing for recommendation to the City Council to rezone from C1A and I-2 to C-3 mix and P public property located at 3155 and 3301 Birch Street. Mr. Allen. All right. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the commission. Again, before you this evening is uh, agenda item number three, seen here on the overview map. Uh, this is located at the uh, northeast corner of Birch Street and Prairie, uh, River Prairie Drive. A little bit more uh, zoomed in uh, picture of the zoning categories, uh, zoning districts here in the uh, in the area. You can see it is uh, bounded by Eau Claire River, the southeast side of the properties in question. 
shows again the uh, notification area and a little more clearly the aerial photo. Uh, the applicant is uh, requesting to rezone this property from C1AP. I don't know if you've ever heard that one before. That's a, <laughs> that is a thing. Uh, but you heard about C1A just moment, moments ago. So this is C1AP uh, and I2 to C3 MX and P public. So I'll jump back here just real briefly to, to show you here that uh, mostly uh, right angle triangle, uh, the north end there uh, is the C1AP. Uh, this is, uh, that's lot two on the overall map that we'll get through here shortly. Uh, I2 is what you see, thank you, Mr. Petrie. The, uh, uh, that's the city owned property currently and then uh, both of those properties owned by the city are I-2. So the applicant is requesting to rezone those two uh, western properties to uh, the C-3MX, which is mixed-use zoning. And then you can see there the proposed P-Public, which would re remain in city ownership. So with that, jump, jumping back to this. Uh, the Request also includes uh, uh, the request again to adopt a general development plan, in this case for mixed use, commercial and multifamily residential uh, in one building. The uh, area shown as lot one, a little bit more closely here. Uh, lot one, you can see here on the, again, at that hard corner there of River Prairie Drive and Birch Street uh, to the bottom left of the screen there. Uh, lot one uh, was declared excess land by the city uh, by the city council uh, actually March of last year and then May of last year request for proposals was issued a proposal from Haas Brothers LLC was accepted and city council resolution authorizing the sale of Haas Brothers LLC and their development partner uh, applicant Gerard Development LLC uh, who's present here this evening as well uh, was approved uh, just last week so with that, uh, again, these are three different lots, as I've noted, uh, that are un under consideration for rezoning. Uh, applicant's site plan identifies these. Again, lot one is noted here at that kind of bottom left of the screen. Lot two, just to the north of that. And then the out lot one along the Eau Claire River. Uh, you may hear and you've seen here that's tried to list all the different addresses associated with that. There are two Birch Street addresses, and one is still re uh, retaining an, uh, an older uh, Galloway Street address, which uh, refers to some property actually on the south side of River Prairie Drive as well. So those are some properties that essentially do not have uh, access to uh, any of the, the roadways here, either River Prairie Drive or Birch Street. So you may see some of these different um, address notations in documentation. Uh, throughout here. Again, lot one is owned by the city of Eau Claire currently, and it's subject to a conditional purchase agreement. Lot two, again, the north part of there, that's more the triangular piece, uh, is privately owned and under contract by the applicant. As I noted, out lot one remains under city ownership. Uh, that also serves as a buffer between uh, the proposed project and the Eau Claire River. So lots one and two are where we're being proposed requested to rezone to the C3MX, which is a mixed-use development overlay district. Uh, outlet one, again, is looking to be proposed essentially on behalf of the city uh, to a more appropriate P-public zoning. Uh, the total size for all three, eight, all three lots is just over five acres in size. Uh, those under private use and proposed for development, lots one and two, uh, total about three and a third acres, plus or minus. And uh, lot one is just under two acres in size. Uh, sorry, yeah, lot we, sorry, lot one is under two acres in size. Lot two is 1.35 acres plus or minus again, uh, and those equal again three point three and a third. Uh, lot one, I should say, is uh, 1.83. Uh, applicant is proposing to construct workforce housing in a four-story building. These are the floor plans. I'll jump ahead more to the architectural renderings here. <coughs> Uh, with 80 total units, uh, those are proposed as, with a breakdown of 37 one-bedroom, 31 two-bedroom, and 12 three-bedroom. 
Uh, it was also noted by the applicant that 10% or eight units would be, quote, reserved for homeless. I'll let them uh, discuss that a little bit more in detail. Uh, the proposed mixed-use building also provides commercial space of just over 9,000 square feet. I'll jump back here quickly. You can see there in blue, the dark blue, that's the commercial area being proposed. Uh, and along with a, an attached two-level parking deck, you can see there in the gray, the north end of the building uh, of 126 spaces. So with this, again, that is the uh, reason the applicant is requesting the MX zoning designation. Uh, just for some context, this is the first MX zoning request since the initial request for such a uh, zoning designation back in 2013 with the Keystone Crossing development at that time. The proposed project itself, see here the overall uh, kind of site layout uh, overlaid with the aerial photo, uh, is just over one and two thirds acres. It's including the building, the parking, and the stormwater, which preserves about an, another uh, one and two thirds acres, or just over 50% of the property as open space. 15% uh, open space is required. Uh, the allowable density is 21 units per acre, or 70 units in this case. Again, as with planned developments, so PD designation, MX zoning allows for the same 25% uh, increase in density if granted by the Planning Commission. Uh, with 80 units proposed, that requested increase is just over 14%. Uh, so certainly under the 25% uh, increase that would be allowed if granted by the Planning Commission. That's, uh, again, an addition of 10 units. Uh, provided some of the uh, criteria that would be considered if you were to grant that increase in density as requested. Uh, staff does find the proposed development, though, to be in substantial compliance with those standards uh, with the requested increase in density. In terms of copies of plan, um, the copies of plan does show this area as a transitional area from mixture commercial to medium and high density residential. Uh, staff finds the proposed development to be in substantial compliance with that as well. I uh, did provide some information on uh, policy aid of objective four, talking about reviewing these types of housing applications in relation to the comprehensive plan. Uh, the general development plan itself, uh, you can see all the drawings here in particular. That's uh, essentially a J-shaped building for lack of a better explanation or descriptor. Again, the residential component occupies essentially the northern two-thirds of the building and has views of the Eau Claire River. Commercial portion of the building occupies southern one-third. Uh, the applicant has noted this as, quote, commercial lease space. Again, don't have any additional details at this point with the general development plan and the rezoning, uh, but those would have to meet um, the uh, requirements as identified in the MX district standards which are provided uh, page four of the staff report, page 29 of the PDF. With that, uh, again, the uh, building is proposed to meet or exceed the minimum 40-foot setback from the top of bank. You can see it here a little bit. Uh, the estimated top of bank is that uh, hatched area to the bottom right, thank you. And of course, they're, they're certainly well above that in terms of setback. You can see they, they attempted to outline here kind of a 40-foot uh, setback around the entire perimeter of the building. Um, with that, no setback modifications are being requested. I uh, do note that you can see there at the north end of the site, a uh, portion of the proposed uh, parking does uh, encroach into that 40-foot proposed setback. Uh, staff uh, would recommend that the final site plan, once that comes forward, would eliminate or remove, or otherwise move those uh, nine kind of parking spaces you see there at the kind of uh, the north end. Uh, the uh, building height for the residential portion is shown at the maximum allowed 40 feet. Jump ahead here quickly. You can see it here, bless you. The, uh, it's again four stories in height with the residential portion and it's just right at that 40 foot uh, maximum uh, excluding the decorative parapet. Uh, the commercial portion is uh, just two stories in height and it's shown approximately 24 feet in height. Uh, the development does propose to extend the River Prairie Trail. Sorry for jumping back and forth quite a bit here. You can see that there in the gray line. Look closely here, the gold line there. 
uh, extending the River Prairie Trail along its full frontage of Birch Street. Some additional amenities you can see here uh, identified as well. Again, this is still a general development plan, so additional details have not yet been provided, but playground to the northeast side of the pro property, and then outdoor recreation area kind of uh, wrapping along the south end of the stormwater retention area. Again, additional details such as landscaping, stormwater management plans, lighting, signage, and, uh, and such will be required as part of the, the final and subsequent uh, site plan submittal and approval process. So this is the uh, most detail that we, one would typically expect with a general development plan. I provided on the, uh, the final two pages of the staff report uh, this, the uh, standards and special requirements for MX uh, zoning district, uh, just to give you a little better um, kind of a summary review of the standards all in one place here. Uh, again, this, these are very similar in nature to a lot of uh, uh, residential plan development standards, but again, uh, some specific items regarding to you know height, uh, types of permitted and conditional uses, uh, building materials, so on and so forth. So uh, again, the, this uh, item was also reviewed, I should, in closing here, uh, was reviewed by a Waterways and Parks Commission at their uh, November 13th meeting last week. Uh, they have recommended approval as uh, submitted. Uh, it is also going to be considered by City Council at its meeting next week. Again, final site plan approval will be reviewed in the future. Uh, the applicant has indicated a spring 2021 construction start. That's in line with their uh, request to or the proposal, I should say, to request uh, low-income housing tax credits through the state. And again, that uh, process here is upcoming in the next couple weeks. So that's the timing for why you're seeing this before you here at this moment. Uh, and again, that process does take several months to get through and presuming they would be successful in that, uh, even that would probably look at a late spring even just announcement period. So in terms of processing that and moving forward with construction, it likely would be the following construction season. But uh, with that, again, you can see uh, color rendering. This is just one uh, viewpoint from that corner of Birch Street and River Prairie Drive. So again, additional, uh, additional renderings would be required as part of the site plan and such, but in terms of just giving a uh, clearer picture, uh, not just to the Planning Commission here, but also to Waterways and Parks Commission and the City Council as well. Applicant uh, provided this just to show material types and just general scale in this area uh, related to its proposed development. So with that, I'll stop talking. I just wanted to walk through a lot of the details here just to give a lot of context since it's uh, uh, not a very common uh, request to do the MX rezoning. So especially in terms of compiling three different pr uh, properties and the mix of zoning currently and proposed. So with that, uh, hopefully I can answer any questions you might have, but the applicant is here and uh, they do have a brief presentation as well and hopefully can answer questions in addition to anything I might be able to add. Great, thank you. Any questions from the commission? Commissioner Gregor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Allen. That was a great presentation. Uh, I do, however, have a question for Ms. Ness, if that's okay. Right. Um, the, uh, obviously, there's a lot of work to be done, you know, with the final site plan and some transportation analysis, presumably, as well. Um, but I guess the, as Mr. Allen mentioned, there was a, um, there's a, a trail improvement that will occur on Birch Street as part of this. And um, can you describe maybe what is, what, going to be considered for for curb and gutter or those types of uh, amenities along this section of Birch Street, which I understand that this half of it is like a kind of a rural cross-section design for the for, for Birch Street. And then also if you could maybe describe like how the, you would foresee, how wide you'd foresee the trail to be or the boulevard and, and those kind of things. Yes, I can talk to the transportation side of things right now. Um, typically with the rezoning, we don't look a lot at the transportation side. We're looking um, more at that with the site plan as we know more about the, the number of 
units that will be in the development, the amount of square footage with the commercial building, we'd look at the traffic generated by those and, and um, the existing traffic on Birch Street to determine if there needs to be any improvements on Birch Street, such as a turn lane, um, the access to the site, and look at those, those items with the site plan. Um, Birch Street is also County Trunk Highway Q, so we do work with the county on uh, improvements to the stretch of Birch Street. Uh, out there right now is an existing approximately 10-foot trail and an 8-foot boulevard, and we would recommend maintaining that along the frontage of Birch Street. Um, and then existing two to the, uh, I'd say, west on Birch Street, southwest, uh, there is a bike lane that ends. As we know more about the traffic in that area and what's needed with this development, if a turn lane is needed or not, we'd address the, the continuation of the bike lane on Birch Street. Uh, as for curb and gutter through the area, there is existing curb and gutter on the north side. Uh, I'll call it north side of Birch Street right now and rural cross section on the south side. And we would, um, as, we, as we look at that pavement and the infrastructure through there, I don't know that it needs to be replaced at this time, but as we go through there with a capital improvement project, we would most likely add the curb and gutter at that time. Okay, any other questions from the commission? I see none. Thank you. Thank you. Is the applicant here? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Welcome. members of the Planning Commission, City of Eau Claire, thank you for the opportunity to address you tonight. We put together a very brief outline of our company. We used to be members of this community back in the 1970s and 80s. Um, I can't uh, say too much about the project because Mr. Allen was very, very thorough. <clears throat> so I'm joined here tonight by Jason Grippenthrog, who was the awarded RFP uh, recipient of this parcel of land. This parcel of land has many interests to our company because it's mixed use, because I think it would score extremely well in the upcoming round with the state agency. It does have public transportation within two tenths of a mile, so that's very important for our scoring criteria. <clears throat> but if you mind, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna take you through a quick scenario. I don't, can you see what I'm looking at? Oh, oh. So, <clears throat> introduction to our company. My father started the company in 1954. He opened an office up there in, uh, on then uh, Highway uh, Business 53. Um, it became the, um, in 1974 through about 1983, it was Girard Realty Corp. Uh, we were responsible for many, many projects in this community. We built a lot of surrounding um, um, subdivisions uh, single family homes. My father was part of a condominium project in downtown and we also built a couple of uh, uh, senior housing projects. And I was the, one of the laborers on the project back in 1980. So <clears throat> the company today is uh, headed by myself and Peter. Project manager and architect on this job would be Brad and uh, Leo Doley's uh, referred to as Uncle Leo. He's built the last 25 projects that we have enjoyed. This is our expanded portfolio. This is how far we've branched out. We chase particular programs. Um, we've been very successful with WIDA, state agency, and we've also branched out into other projects as well. Condo project in downtown La Crosse, which was an infill with uh, some um, office component. There's a, an example of one of our student rentals. Uh, it's the only brick student rental in, in town in La Crosse. River Falls, this is an important to note that the, 
the picture up there on the right is what we told the council we'd build. That's what we really built down there on the left. This is another infill mixed use development. We answered an RFP back in 2008. It's uh, three blocks from Mayo Clinic. This is a project that we just finished in Hudson, Wisconsin. It's a senior project. Again, the rendering and the rendering on the right. This is a development that we just completed in North Hudson. Um, uh, rendering on the left and then uh, new uh, what we actually built on the right. This is a project that's under construction that was highly controversial in the city of River Falls right next to City Hall. Uh, we were on the Kinnikinick River, so we came in with some senior housing uh, known as the depot. It used to be the old train depot site. There was some contamination on it, so we've worked with the city on that. And we are also putting a um, market rate project there called City Station downtown right on the river. This is our team of individuals. We're a very small office, but we produce a lot of work. So the reason why we chose Eau Claire is for a number of reasons. We've built very good mouse traps over the years, mixing um, um, housing with uh, commercial, and those play very well off each other. The commercial sometimes drives the low, lower cost of housing, and we're able to do other things with our, with our housing, such as making units available to um, homeless individuals. We currently have a partnership with Westcap, who has a partnership with uh, Western Dairyland to try and place some of your homeless individuals. Um, so those, those folks will be heavily involved in this project. Um, just to kind of give you a, a, a timetable that Mr. Allen touched on, um, we will submit this project to the state agency on December 6th. That doesn't give us a lot of time. The awards come out in late April. That gets us to our next funding cycle through Department of Administration with an award uh, of that funding cycle is sometime in October. We are also will be applying for to Federal Home Loan Bank in Chicago for a grant of 900000 on this project. Um, so there's a lot of building blocks that, that, that developers like myself go through um, to, to build this type of a project in your community. And there's multiple layers of funding, funding sources on this. Uh, we do have a uh, lender in mind. We also have an investing partner member that is willing to purchase these credits from us if we are successful. And with that, I was told to be brief, so I will let, let you have questions now. Thank you. Any questions from the commission? Commissioner Wolfgren. Thank you, Mr. Gerard. Um, so a couple of things that I think most of us know that your experience with WIDA tax credits scoring system being awarded those tax credits is, um, it's very vital when we're talking about a project like this actually coming into fruition. We also know that the definition of workforce housing has been evolving. Traditionally, 60 to 120 percent of county median income or area median income for our area, they're about the same. It's around $51,000. The real workforce um, is between 30 and 50. About 40 percent of our workforce in Eau Claire makes between 15 and about $25,000 a year. So I was wondering if you could just do an estimate of the breakdown of your income limits in terms of the 80 Units and I also wanted to say that it's cutting edge. It's cutting edge across the country that you offer 10% of your units to homeless individuals, and then partnering with Western Dairyland and Westcap to case manage. So that is cutting edge. So I want to commend you for that. Well, thank you. So I was got ahead of myself because I didn't know how much time I'd have, but so. Mr. Allen gave you a brief overview of how many ones, twos, and threes. 
the three bedroom units will have all individual access. They'll have uh, entrances from the outside right into their apartment. Those are going to have, those will be at 50% incomes. Families need help, so they need lower rents. Those units will also qualify um, for um, support services through Western Dairyland or Western Dairy Cap and uh, West Cap. We have, um, we will serve 20 disabled American veterans in this building with incomes of 30% and lower. So we will also serve about 30 units at the 50% category. Um, we will have uh, some market rate um, apartments in this as well, twos, um, twos and three bedrooms at considerably lower than our competition. The tax credits really fund the equity needed to support those lower rents. So. Thank you. Did you have another question, Commissioner Wolfgram? Not, not right now, thank you. Okay. Any other questions from the commission? Mr. Gregor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gerard. Um, I really appreciate all the detail providing at this early stage, obviously focused on, on the, um, the rezoning right now, but I'm kind of looking ahead uh, at the excitement here and thinking about the site plan as that develops and gets more specific. And so this is something we'll be back to, of course, but um, you know, when I look at the, you know, what has been drawn out so far, the, some of the sidewalk connectivity and the, and the intention to, to build, uh, build out the bike path and things like that. I'm, I'm excited about the, the possibilities. Um, as we can see in this particular um, rendering, there's, the sidewalk does not actually go around the entirety of the building. So my question would be is, would you be, um, would you consider exploring the possibility of having it go around the entire building? And also, would you consider having that sidewalk connect over to River Prairie Drive in addition to connecting over to Birch Street where, because it, since it's kind of at a corner where there's two trails, I could, I could see some desire um, of pedestrians and bicyclists to, to, to try to access the building from, from both directions. So I guess as you, as you look at the site plan in the long term, do you see either of those being possibilities for connectivity? Number of questions, so I'll try and break them down one at a time. <clears throat> It would be very important for us to have a direct link uh, access to the municipal transportation. So you'll see for certain um, direct uh, connectivity to public transportation. Um, the second question is we're very sensitive to uh, bringing sidewalks all the way around the building because we have a commercial component there. We're trying to pull that commercial component as far out to the corner as possible to obtain the highest square footage rents that we can achieve. So we're trying to leave that a little bit softer, so to speak, so that it just looks like it's a commercial component up on, up on the corner um, and not bringing the sidewalk for the, for the, for the apartment uh, dwellers, so to speak. Because the apartment dwellers that you see there in the rendering they will also have direct, can you go backwards in your, no, no, on the other one, please, thank you. One, a couple of slides, I just wanna let them see the basement. So, right here, thank you. So, the conditioned parking at Subterranean, we're also taking advantage of that topography of that site so that we don't have to over excavate. So we're actually going to have a front and a rear door for those lower units. So think of it as, it, sim it will simulate a home. You'll have uh, a basically a car pulling in and they can bring their groceries or whatever right into the back door of the home. And then with direct access for the children to then run out the front door because we know they do that. So um, 
So we tried to accommodate all groups and all walks of life with this plan, and I think we've done a very good job. And yes, we will answer a lot more of your questions when the site plan comes back for the SIP and GDP. Right? Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. You've been very helpful. Thank you very much. Did you want me to go through the timeline? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So uh, our timeline, I think uh, Mr. Allen touched on it. We would break ground on this project uh, in April or May of 22 with a lease up and achievement in 23 after we've attained all of our sources. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Are there any members of the public here to speak on this item? Welcome again. Judy Mosley again. Uh, you know, for about a year and a half that I've been um, co-chairing the Affordable Housing Task Force, I have kept hearing Mr. Gerard's name. Um, when, I'm, when I'm talking to the WIDA people, when I'm talking to folks in Madison, when I'm talking to lenders, whenever I'm talking about affordable housing, people say, well, Paul, Paul Gerard does that all the time. And I kept saying, well, why doesn't Paul Gerard come here? So I was really, really pleased when I heard that he was coming here. And I was even more pleased when he agreed to meet with me and some other members of the Affordable Housing Task Force to talk about his plan as well as affordable housing in general. And I'm pretty impressed with how passionate he is about it. Um, he really knows his stuff and he really is, is willing to listen to community members and to get their input and that's always important. As far as the um, zoning issue that's before you tonight though, I do wanna point out that this is a really good spot for this development for workforce housing. When you look around that area within walking and biking distance, you have nursing homes, restaurants, grocery stores, lots of places with lots of workers that make relatively low incomes. And this is a good housing development for those people. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any questions from the commission? Thank you. Any other members of the public here to speak on this topic tonight? I see none. Is there a motion from the commission? Commissioner uh, Breno. I'd move approval. Thank you. It's second. second. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we'll go with Commissioner Gregor. <laughs> All right, any discussion? Commissioner Gregor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to show my support for um, this rezoning. I, I think one of the things that I think is significant is that this is one of the major entrances to the city, and it, so this project can really set the tone for, for what people can expect when they enter the city, and, and you know the way it's proposed to, to be developed. It, I think it respects the, the site as well on the river, and, um, just really. I think it's an exciting project, so thanks. Good, thank you. Any other comments? I see none, so we'll call a question. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? There are none. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Good luck as you move forward. Number five is a public discussion Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one. Number four is a public discussion for recommendation to city council uh, to approve the final plat for 80 twin home lots at uh, Jeffers Ridge Twin Homes, east of Jeffers Road, west of Northwest Community Park. Mr. Thank Petrie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, before you is a final plat. Uh, the applicant has requested tonight that we change the rec or change the number of lots. They would like to do this in two phases, and that's um, up to this commission tonight. The 
Council will review this on Tuesday, November 26. The amendment is to do two phases, and the applicant can talk about it more, the reason why they want to do it. But uh, the proposal in front of you would be changing from 80 lots to 48 lots and two out lots. The second phase would come back to this commission and council at a later date. It is number four on the map on the north side of town. No, that is not. Oh, I might have missed the uh, the slides there. Um, but more or less so, the applicant is requesting a final uh, plat approval located on the east side of Jeffers Road, west uh, of the community park. Uh, this was a twin home development that was approved by the commission. Again, the applicant is requesting that we change the from 80 lots to 48 lots and two out lots. All the proposed lots do meet the R2 standards, R2P standards. Utility easements have been requested by um, AT&T and Charter and are shown on the plat. The plat is consistent with the preliminary plat. The developer's agreement for the street and utility work is a separate agenda item at council, which will include the 48 lots and the two out lots. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions for the proposal. Thank you. Any questions from the commission for Mr. Petrie? Uh, Commissioner Christofferson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, which which lots are we going to be considering for this evening? I uh, will leave that up to the applicant. Oh, oh, they'll give us, okay, thank you. All right. Any other questions for Mr. Petrie? I see none. Thank you. And the applicant is here, I take it. Welcome. Good evening. I'm Jeremy Scow with Real Land Surveying. Um, Ryan will pull up a copy of the plat to to answer answer your question. But yeah, we're just going to go with uh, uh, those 48 lots right now and a couple out lots. I see once he has it pulled up here. Yeah, so, so the lots, <clears throat> excuse me, the lots we will be emitting on this first phase will be from 35 up around the corner all the way to 66. So those are the ones that will be omitted from this first phase. So which which so ones are included? The ones when they're included, we'll start with number one in the corner. Yep, where the cursor's at. So one all the way down to the south and to the west, 29, and up and around, um, up around the corner there. So. So yeah, so one through 34, and then 67 through 80, I believe, the ones that will be included in this first phase. And then the two, I guess the out lots too, for the stormwater purposes. And the two uh, cul-de-sacs. Cul yep, those will be omitted. All right. And where are the out lots you were talking about? Um, the big one right there in the middle or the stormwater one right there in the middle and then over there to the east um, is the other out lot underneath where the that big high line transmission lines are at. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the commission? Mr. Wolfgram. Good evening. Um, I'm just curious how you're going to be determining price points for your twin homes. That is something I can defer to the developer. Thank you. Any other questions? I see none. Is there, uh, is the developer here or are you speaking nope, as I'm the not applicant? Speak. I'm just as the applicant. The developer is here okay. if you'd like to All right. come up and maybe answer your question. Hi there, Welcome. Steve Wiggins. Um, it'll be market rate. I mean, so cost plus profit equals, <laughs> so consistent with what we did at Green Park. So, yep. Any other questions? Thank you. Any other questions for the developer? All right. Thank you. So this item was uh, on the agenda as public discussion. At this point, we will entertain a motion um, so I have a question for Mr. Allen. Do we need to specify the lot numbers, exactly what we're approving here? 
That would be helpful, yes. Okay. I was trying to track this as well. So we're looking at uh, lot numbers 1 through 34, 67 through 80, um, out lot number 1 and out lot number 2. All right. Is there a motion for, for those? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Mr. Grant, um, Grandland. All right. Any discussion? I see none. So we'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. That motion passes. Congratulations. Now we can go to number five, which is recommendation to the city council to approve the final plat for 46 lots within the extraterritorial jurisdiction in the town of Washington, south of County Road Double I and east of Highway 93. Mr. Petrie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, before you is the final plat uh, located in the ETJ. Uh, Real Land Surveying is the applicant. Uh, the property owner is Southside Properties EC LLC. Uh, it's approximately 99 acres. Uh, this was before you uh, as the preliminary plat, and now that it's the final plat, um, in your packet is the final plat and the aerial photograph. This plat consists of 48 lots, 44 for single family, two uh, lots for commercial, and four out lots for stormwater. The plat is consistent with the preliminary plat, and in terms of the agreement between the city and the town, the town of Washington and Eau Claire County are in the process of reviewing the final plat. This will be on the council's agenda uh, on Tuesday, November 26. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions from the commission? I see none. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, who is the applicant here? Thank you. Welcome back. Howdy. Um, yeah, Ryan did a good job explaining what's going on there. Um, yeah, I guess I can field any questions if you guys have any. Any questions from the commission? Commissioner Wolfgram. So I have the same question uh, in terms of how you're going to determine price points for your single family. That is a question for the developer who is not here. So mm -hmm. I cannot speak on behalf of him. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Christofferson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, could you talk in a little bit more detail about the, the stormwater treatment, the way, how is that being handled here? Um, that was something that uh, I'd have to defer to the, the engineer who designed all this. Um, I'm just the, just the surveyor, so maybe he could answer some questions. Thank about you. It too. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Bohan. Good evening, Sean Bohan with Advanced Engineering Concepts. Um, so you had questions on the stormwater. Um, we have a, a number of uh, stormwater facilities um, through the site. Um, it's gonna be conveyed via ditches, um, and then we end up having some stormwater ponds that are abutting the wetlands. Um, so they'll end up being water quality um, and then also infiltration. So they'll either have standing water in it or it'll be empty um, in some of the areas where it's more conducive towards the infiltration. Um, one thing that's unique on this site um, is that we do end up having a central treatment for wastewater. Um, so I wasn't sure if that was maybe something that you might have been referring to, is that we do not have individual septic systems uh, for this, for this uh, subdivision. It's actually gonna be concentrated, taken to one um, area, go through um, some treatment tanks, and then um, be a community system that's going to be through a homeowners association. So, very unique. Hmm. Mr. Christopherson? Mm -hmm. Once that uh, water has been treated, how, how is it released? Is it, how is it released? Um, it is released um, similar to like what you would end up having for a drain field. Uh, it's going to be through dispersion, but it's already it's a little bit different in the sense that your septic systems end up using 
that to treat the water. They use the soil to treat or to treat the wastewater. It's actually already treated, so it's actually clean water that's going down through this. So it's just basically infiltrating and recharging groundwater, but it's already been treated. Yes. There's a lot of attention in the town of Washington about the quality of their groundwater and, and maintaining it because of the, the subterranean structure. So I'm, I'm just wondering in this development if the planning for the HOA includes the vision forward to maintaining that. I mean, is. Um, it does. Um, the, the people that will be maintaining it, it's, I think it's called Peterson on site. Um, it's the name of the company. They'll come and actually maintain it a couple times a year. Um, then it's also hooked up telemetry wise. So they basically are able to monitor it from computers off site. Um, but they will be taking care of that. And that's part of uh, um, and signing up with them, having them install the facility. They want to make sure that it's, main, um, that it's working properly. Um, so it's something that they end up doing. And, and they have reps, I think, that maybe come over from the Minneapolis area that will be um, going ahead and, and doing the maintenance and stuff on this facility. Okay, any other questions? I see none, thank you. Thank you. All right, this item is listed for public discussion. Do we have a motion from the commission for this? I'll move for approval. Mr. Wolfgram. I'll second. Commissioner Brenholm. All right, any discussion? I see none. So we'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Congratulations. Thank you. Number six is uh, for public discussion. For recommendation to City Council declaring excess land east of Highway uh, East of London Road and south of Damon Street. Ms. Ness. Good evening. Southside Holdings Company the, are the owners of the building located at 2715 Damon Street. Um, the item that we're discussing is number six uh, on the area map shown on the screen. Um, they're looking to expand their building and earlier this year they approached the city about uh, the property located at 4203 London Road. It's used by the city as a stormwater quality pond. Um, it, we are asking Southside Holdings to modify, design and construct uh, at their expense the existing stormwater pond to meet the existing and the proposed need at that location. Um, in in uh, response to the city declaring excess land and them purchasing that land from the city for their use. Uh, the purchase price is $165,000. And um, I'll give you some maps to give a better uh, idea of where we're looking at here. Uh, the Property is located east of London Road, north of Gulf Road, uh, west of State Trunk Highway 93. The excess land that is hatched in the yellow is an existing uh, stormwater quality pond that the city owns. Uh, the revisions that would be required by the proposed purchaser would be incorporated on the south site of that location. And you can see South Side Holding Properties owns the two properties to the east of this location, and the excess land uh, would be the yellow indicated area just west and south of their properties. With that, I'll take any questions. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from the commission? I see none. Thank you. And the city is the applicant. Correct. So we uh, can move on to see if there's a motion for this item. Mr. Granlin. I'll move approval. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Commissioner Obeyed. All right. 
Any discussion? I see none. So we'll call a question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that passes. Number seven is public discussion for recommendation to city council to grant an above ground pole easement uh, between the city of Eau Claire and Northern States Power at 800 block for a uh, forest street. Ms. Ness. This item is number seven in your packet and number seven on the map shown on the screen. Excuse me. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, Northern States Power is requesting an easement along the west side of Forest Street. This is in a result to the capital improvement project that the city just completed along Forest Street. Um, the expansion of the multi-use trail on the west side of Forest Street extends from the High Bridge to Madison Street. Um, just south of the central maintenance facility that the city owns, uh, we own another property, and this is where the easement is being proposed. Uh, there were two existing poles that were in uh, conflict with the proposed multi-use path. And so the easement uh, allows for the guy span wires to be uh, located on the city property. Uh, the proposed easement, the southern easement is uh, 10 feet by 22 feet, and it would have just the guy wire within the easement. And the northern location is a guy and pole uh, that would be 10 feet by 19 feet. And this is a picture of the northern pole. Uh, you can see there's, there was one existing pole that guide the facility on the east side. Um, two poles have been placed. The southern pole on the left-hand side of the sidewalk in the picture uh, is the easement pole for Excel Energy. The pole to the north is a different easement that will be brought forward at a later date. Um, the structure is really supporting the, the Excel facilities that run along the east side of Forest Street. And then I have one more picture of the southern guy pole. And that pole remained in the same location, but the guy was just extended to the west to provide a 10-foot clearance minimum over the trail to allow for uh, maintenance vehicles and uh, access through that area. Okay, thank you. Any, uh, so the city is the applicant again? Correct. Um, any questions? I see none, thank you. So we will uh, see if there's a motion on this item. Commissioner Seymour. Thank you, I move approval. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Commissioner Brenholt. All right, any discussion? And we'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that passes. And uh, number eight. I'm turning my page a little too soon here. Number eight, uh, for approval by the plan commission, a six unit uh, site plan for a six unit apartment building at 2417 Jackson Street. Mr. Petrie. Thank you again. Uh, Number eight on your map is located on the north side of downtown area. Uh, the parcel is currently vacant, uh, as you can see in the aerial. Uh, it's on Jackson Street. The property is currently zoned R4. The lot size is 10,625 square feet. The applicant is uh, Greenpoint Construction and they are the property owner. Advanced Engineering Concepts is the engineer. Uh, before you is a six unit apartment complex attached in your packet is the site plan and proposed elevation the site plan shows a two-story building uh, approximately a footprint of uh, 3,000 square feet the site plan does show a common driveway with the property to the east which is existing and the applicant does own that as well um, this should be uh, this will require a shared access agreement the reason being is because you've ever sold one of them that access agreement would be in place. The narrative notes that the six unit will be four two bedroom units and two one bedroom units with a den. 
The plan commission are, is reviewing this under the multifamily design manual. The design of the, the building appears to be uh, basic in design and lacking detail. Uh, the, this commission which can add any condition to the site plan and to the building elevation. As noted in the menu of the multifamily, uh, multifamily apartments will have pitch roofs, front uh, facades, front facing bu uh, buildings with windows and doors, porches and balconies. Uh, I would note in this one, the parking requirement is at 10 stalls. As you can see on the site plan, uh, they have one stall that's in the front yard. The, the front yard would be considered 20 feet from the property line to the front of the structure. The manual does not allow front yard parking unless approved by this commission. If it had a garage facing the street, then that would be considered um, appropriate. In this situation, the closest thing to the road, though, it would be a parking stall. Bicycle parking is noted on the site plan and should meet the city standards. Uh, again, the building elevation is shown on the proposed facade. The landscape plan does show street trees, uh, evergreen plantings between the commercial to the west and the industrial to the south. They also are showing um, foundation plantings. Sidewalk connection to the public street shall be provided and added to the site plan. The dumpster shall be fully enclosed uh, per the city standards. Grading and drainage is noted in your report along with public utilities, traffic and transit. There is a few conditions that need to be met before the site plan is approved tonight. And with that, I'd stand for any questions. Thank you. Any questions for the, from the commission? I have one um, that you, you might have covered. That uh, extra parking stall in the front yard, does that require a conditional use permit or if we pass the site plan, it, it's there. If this gets approved as is shown, uh, you'd be going against the multifamily design manual because it talks about prohibited front yard parking. Okay. Any questions? Commissioner Gregor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Petrie, I think looking very closely at this, appears as part of a a second parking stall that's also within the 20 feet of within the right of way so that, that is correct they so need to shift it all back at the 20 foot setback that's correct okay thank you any other questions i see none thank you is the applicant here welcome back Good evening. Um, again, Sean Bohan, Advanced Engineering, uh, 1504 Sherwin Avenue. Um, we're okay with the conditions, I guess with the exception of the, the parking, we're having, um, you know, it's not a deep stall. It's pretty similar to what we're asking for from what's out there. Um, we definitely can shift some of the stuff to the south a little bit, but we do end up having um, a 10 foot setback that we end up having to keep from the commercial property that's there, I believe for the buffering, is that correct? So it's limiting, you know, how far to the south that we can shift it, but certainly um, one, of the, one of the stalls and stuff that we can, we can definitely end up getting out of that 20 foot setback. Um, the other one will be about eight feet into it. Um, it's just a tight site. Um, and you know we're trying to trying to mimic kind of what's out there and everything. We do end up having some changes. I don't think that maybe we're updated with maybe the building elevations and stuff. But um, you know we do show a front door um, that ends up abutting Jackson Street and and their sidewalk and stuff that go to it on the site plan. Um, it's just the building elevation I don't believe was was updated. So, but with that I will answer any other questions that you may have. Any, uh, Commissioner Wolfgram. Good evening, Mr. Bohan. Good evening. Um, am I correct in reading that these units are quote unquote middle income and quote unquote reasonable rents? Um, I will end up deferring that to <laughs> the owner who is here. Okay. Um, but if you want that answered now or if anybody else okay, has any questions for myself. Questions for Mr. Bohan. Okay. Oops, sorry. Any other question for Mr. Bohan? 
Commissioner Gregor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Bellahan. Um, you mentioned a, a building elevation facing Jackson Street that did have a door. Um, what, I guess okay, what I so that's the updated version. I guess that would be the updated okay. version that it does have front door. Okay. All right, because that's not in our packet, but this something that staff has. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Bohan? All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. If you could just introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Patrick Hull. I'm with Greenpoint Construction. Great. Um, to address the uh, sort of the price point uh, of the apartments, it sort of also goes along with um, the multifamily housing plan manual uh, that you have that requires, you know, the articulated facades and front porches uh, and things like that. We've tried to keep this a fairly basic building because it fits with the other buildings that are right in the neighborhood. Anytime you add an architectural feature, you raise the cost of the building. In this case, if we add sort of the front porch look on each of the two main entrances and one on the front of the building um, that was pointed out by, by city staff, we would add about $25,000 to the project. When you add in financing costs over 20 years, you get about to $45,000. Over six units, over 20 years, that adds about $30 per rent um, for each unit over that amount of time. So. Um, we can add those features. We would like to not so that we can keep rents down low. The uh, management company manages uh, apartments throughout the city, ranging on the two-bedroom side from $695 uh, up to $1,400. The price point for these uh, is somewhere between, depending on how the structure is, is finalized, $750 to $800 per month for a two-bedroom apartment which is below fair market value uh, for Eau Claire County and is about 10% below what the median rent for a two-bedroom apartment is uh, in the city of Eau Claire. Uh, so we are trying to stay on that lower price point uh, to, uh, to allow a, a wide diversity of, of housing within this community. Thank you. Any uh, Commissioner Wolfgram. I just want to say thank you. Welcome. Are there any, any other questions? questions? Sorry. All right. Uh, yeah. Oh, just, oh I'm sorry. sorry. Mr. Seymour. I came in late. Thank you. Um, just a point to that. Um, it seems like if you added any kind of porches or roof lines, you're, you're going to have some setback issues anyway, right? Likely correct. I mean... You're, it's pretty tight right now, it looks like to me. So, thanks. Thank you. I have another question for uh, staff if, before we move on a little bit. So, if we approved, uh, even if they shifted it back, we'd still be encroaching about eight feet into the front yard, and that would put us in conflict with the design standards manual, correct? That is correct. How often does that happen where we're in conflict with the design standard manual? Since I've been here, I don't, I don't know. Okay. Um, I do know, to answer Mr. Greger's question, they did revise their elevation before the meeting um, to allow for the door entry off of the front. So that unit you'd enter from the front uh, we got those revisions prior to the or after the packer went out. Um, but to answer the chairperson's question, I don't uh, believe we have. And I've been here four and a half years. The other option the applicant would have would be to reduce one of the two bedrooms down to one bedroom, in my opinion. And therefore, you leave them of one of the parking stalls. That is correct. Or the plan commission can waive that parking stall requirement. Which we haven't made a habit of doing. Well, the parking stall requirement, we, we have. We, you have. 
So th there are some options at the before you tonight. Where is public transit from here? Are they getting credit for? They're getting 10% for transit, but not any additional credits for bicycle parking because it's not in the central business district zoning, tower four zoning. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Seymour. Thank you. So how many spots should this building have before the reductions? I mean, if we're, if we're gonna maybe waive one of these spots, how, how much of a hole are we putting them in? May, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Well, while Mr. Petrie's looking that up, uh, I, I, obviously the uniqueness of the uh, the layout of the property certainly speaks to some variety in the in the layout too, because of the fact that you were talking about front yard. Uh, but again, in this case, front yard is orientation of the building is almost like a side yard and how it functions, especially as it's trying to mirror what's already existing. But uh, again, what's existing would not necessarily meet current multifamily That's design correct. manual standards. So it's one of those, a bit of a hybrid situation trying to accommodate uh, as applicant and, and developer have noted, uh, you know, some affordability considerations in reference to what's already existing, but again, still trying to, you know, be responsive to the multifamily design manual. Uh, in this case, if it's simply the parking requirement, that's certainly something, as Mr. Petrie noted, there are some options available. Correct. So my understanding is four two-bedrooms and two one-bedrooms. That would be 10 stalls required. If you give them a 10% reduction, they're down to nine, technically. Is that correct, sir? That is correct. Okay. So technically, they only require nine. So if they lost the first one and pushed it back to, uh, to line up with the building, uh, for the second stall that Mr. Gregor pointed out, they would be in compliance with the parking requirement for the city. Okay. Mr. Bohan, did you have something to add? That's what I was coming up to add there. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you're okay with that? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none, we can uh, entertain a motion if there's one. Commissioner Seymour. Thank you. So I'll move approval with, we're gonna waive one of the parking spots. Is that, is that correct? Or do we need to do that after discussion? That would be an appropriate time. Okay, so moved. That would be an appropriate time. The, uh, do we need it? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit lost. So are we, uh, the motion before us is with the reduced parking stall, is that correct? Yes. Okay, is there a second? I will second. Thank you. All right, any discussion? Seeing none, we'll call a question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Congratulations, thank you. Thank you. And uh, under discussion and direction, we have some comments from Mr. Allen about a UA Local 434 Plumbers Union Comprehensive Plan map amendment request. Mr. Thank Allen. You. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the commission. Uh, this is a specific discussion direction, specifically direction item uh, for this evening, uh, including your packet or some materials uh, staff received from the UA Local 434 Plumbers Union uh, requesting that plan commission initiate a comprehensive plan amendment for property located at W3380, State Trunk Highway 37, which is uh, otherwise known as Little Red School. Uh, the current comprehensive plan, planned land use map, uh, currently designates these properties. You can see there as being appropriate for school use. You can see the blue is the area in question specifically. Jumping back just real quickly, 
you can see how it's pretty clearly del uh, delineated actually uh, by parcel A and parcel B. Parcel A is Little Road School proper. Uh, this is the area that the Plumbers Union is, has actually recently purchased, is looking to utilize the uh, property for uh, educational training purposes for their members and plumbing students. You can see here, this is the, the overall property as a whole. But again, they're looking to break that up into what you see here is parcel A and B, which actually uh, does match up with the blue and then the green park use uh, vacant in this case uh, with the copies of plan, planned land use map. So again, the, just to go back briefly, the applicant would like to use the property for uh, educational training purposes for both its uh, their members and for plumbing students. Uh, the, this would include classroom space, uh, testing areas, tools and machinery training areas, as well as offices and some incidental storage space. Uh, the, just a little bit of background, you may recall uh, this property was annexed into the city of Eau Claire from the town of Brunswick following a plan commission review back uh, in early June, uh, city council adoption uh, the following week. Uh, this was then subsequently transferred to the Eau Claire Area School District uh, because this is one of the properties that was essentially uh, historically just lagging in terms of being more fully transferred over to the Eau Claire Area School District from strictly city ownership. So this is one of the school properties from decades ago that was still remnant and had not been turned over fully to the school district. So that was the uh, process that was taken uh, back in June. Uh, subsequent to that, the school district sold the property, again, as these two parcels here, uh, one as the balance of the vacant land on the east there, uh, about uh, tw not quite 23 acres. Uh, that was to the neighboring property owner. And then the other, again, is that Little Red School, which is uh, just around 11 acres in size to the, the plumber's union. So just for some context, that was kind of setting the stage, the little history, uh, very immediate history, in fact, and uh, what the intentions are of the plumber's union, and therefore kind of next steps, the request here is to initiate the hearing process to allow the plan commission and city council consideration of the plan amendment. So that's the process that's required is that uh, applicants, property owners can't simply just file for a comprehensive plan amendment like they might with a rezoning or a condition use permit and such. Uh, it has to be initiated uh, by the plan commission. So again, the plan commission by comprehensive plan policies and state law is responsible for proposing amendments to the comprehensive plan. So I included the uh, criteria. Uh, I did not have that on the slides, apologize, but uh, included in the packet was the, were the criteria the Plan Commission City Council should review in considering a change to the comprehensive plan. That's not what's ne uh, necessarily before you tonight. You don't need to review all the criteria tonight, just kind of a precursor to what would be considered when you actually hold hearings for that, should you choose to move forward in that manner. So again, the plan commission is only being asked at this time to initiate the hearings to consider the change. Uh, the plan commission does decide to initiate the hearings. The applicant is also prepared to bring forth uh, rezoning and other applications for their project. Uh, they're already prepared to do that. They've uh, put together paperwork for the rezoning as well. Uh, again, this will allow the city to process and consider the comprehensive plan amendment rezoning uh, concurrently. So. Uh, at the moment, uh, you know, site plan, it may be uh, administrative in nature, simply doing some land use uh, changes, but not necessarily modifying the entire site. Again, we haven't reviewed uh, anything beyond what's before you tonight uh, at that point. So uh, can't say all the other applications that would be necessary uh, beyond the comprehensive plan amendment and then also the rezoning. So with that, uh, did make a recommendation and I recommend the plan commission do initiate comprehensive plan amendment. Uh, again, that all it would do is to allow public hearings to be set for consideration of the request. I should note as well that it's a, I'll defer a little bit, leaning over to Mr. Petrie, 45 day process, is that correct? So it's a 45 day notification process, a little bit broader and longer than 
uh, a standard rezoning issues process that's typically 30 days. So uh, again, this is uh, much like the MX zoning earlier. It's a little bit unique in terms of the process and uh, something that's not uh, a common thing that comes before the Planning Commission. Uh, however, this was more recently before you. Uh, Hope Gospel uh, came forward uh, about this time in 2017. So only about two years ago, they went through the same process where they uh, moved from a purely, I think it was a residential designation to more of a commercial designation. So they had to do that in order to move forward with their current facilities uh, on North Claremont, that's correct. So, so with that, uh, I'll stand for any questions. Thanks. Do we need a motion to do something here? Yes, please. I should have noted that more clearly. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. If there's a, just a motion to uh, initiate uh, hearings for the comprehensive plan amendment. Okay. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Commissioner Christofferson, um, I, have a, I have a question that I'm actually kind of reticent to use our time up on because I'm sure that I'm missing something. But this was this was uh, actually within the jurisdiction of the city of Eau Claire at what at one time. It was owned by the city of Eau Claire. It was owned, it's yes. no longer owned by the city of Eau Claire. Correct. It was owned yes. when it was annexed in. It was owned still back in June by the city when, of Eau Claire, and, when and was, then was transferred back once it was annexed. Is transferred to the Eau Claire Area School District. Again, it was the old. It was a remnant oh. that had not been formally turned we over to the it school in district recently. I thought we like unannexed it. No, no, it was annexed <laughs> in. So if you see a map, there's an island okay. out there because it is non-contiguous annexation. All right. Yes. I'm sorry. I knew I was missing something. Anyway, uh, is there any discussion? All right. Uh, seeing none, I will call the question. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes. Thank you. Any code compliance items? Future agenda items? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, thank you. So I was thinking it would be great to have an update on our um, rental registration program that I think is approaching two years of uh, activity. So um, not sure exactly what I mean by an update, but whatever staff would think would be relevant. I obviously like the number of reg rental registrations of, that have been filed, for example, would be a good one, and maybe their location or at least a general sense of locations. But just be nice to know how that program is working and the relevance to the planning commission, of course. Okay. Sure, certainly. And again, uh, I'll get with uh, the Eau Claire City County Health Department and see what they could uh, provide for us. Great. Thank you. Any other uh, future agenda items? Additions have, or corrections to the minutes? I do have a future agenda item, Mr. Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we are waiting. Uh, there is another application deadline next Wednesday, I believe, because of the Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, but at this current state, we have no applications pending for December 16th. Oh. So not before you this evening to cancel that meeting, but something to consider uh, once we see how any applications may come in next week, if any. Okay. And we'll let you Thank know you. what happens at that point. All right. Uh, any other future agenda items? Corrections or additions to the minutes? I see none. So without objection, the meeting is adjourned. A transcript of this meeting is available for the hearing impaired. It will be available within seven days of this telecast. Call 715-839-4912 or TDD 715-839-1689 or write Eau Claire City Clerk, P.O. Box 5148, Eau Claire, Wisconsin 54702-5148.